Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Kim Daniels. I'm the Associate Director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life. We want to thank you so much for joining us here tonight for this discussion of faith, race, and politics. This is part of our series on faith and the faithful, and tonight we'll explore the intersection of faith, race, and politics in the U.S., particularly in this election season, as we seek to bring a range of experiences and perspectives to the broader conversation on these often divisive subjects. As issues of race have moved front and center in our public life to a degree we haven't seen in years, we need only think of the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and the protests that erupted in its wake, the white supremacist hatred and violence in Charlottesville, and President Trump's equivocal and normalizing response, the El Paso shooting, or the demonization of Central American migrants fleeing violence and poverty. Just yesterday, we saw a report that the president suggested that soldiers shoot migrants in the leg to show, slow them down as they attempted to cross our southern border. Meanwhile, systemic racism in our criminal justice system and stark racial inequality in our country persists. African Americans' median income is less than half that of white Americans, and the wealth gap is even more striking. African Americans' intergenerational mobility is much lower as well, and this community continues to suffer serious disadvantages in public education and housing and employment due to structural inequalities. This should break our hearts, and it should challenge all of us, regardless of race or party or faith. And it prompts us to ask what Christian witness looks like in a moment like this. It should also prompt us to ask how issues of race affect our views on policy matters as diverse as immigration, criminal justice reform, poverty, gun violence, the plight of refugees, and many others. Religious voters have a decidedly mixed record when it comes to race and politics. President Trump continues to have the support of evangelical voters, even as many other religious voters strongly oppose his policies. As Catholics, we know that principles of Catholic social thought, beginning with the belief in the equal dignity of all, should lead us to call on our political leaders to work together against racism. For as the church teaches, respect for every person and every race is respect for basic rights, dignity, and fundamental equality. So tonight we've brought together a remarkable group to help us think through these issues, including Adele Banks, Bishop Daniel Flores, Justin Gibney, and Reverend Jim Wallace. John Carr, the director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, will moderate our discussion. Before founding the initiative six years ago, John served for over 20 years as director of the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, directing the conference's public policy and advocacy efforts on major domestic and international issues. This is now the initiative's third major dialogue of the academic year, with more gatherings in the pipeline. We hope we'll continue to advance this conversation of principled dialogue at the intersection of faith and public life. We're so glad that you all can join us here this evening, and please join our conversation on Twitter at GUCST Public Life using the hashtag Faith Race Politics. Thanks all of you to, for joining us. Thanks to our panelists, and over to you, John. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim, and thank you to our uh, co-sponsors, the Institute of Politics and Public Service, and our colleagues at Berkeley, our friends over at the Democracy Fund, Chris Crawford and his colleagues have helped us do an entire series on faith and the faithful in public life. I think this might be the sixth one we've done. This one is different in a lot of ways. In a polarized nation, faith, race, and politics can be divisive on their own. A lot of family dinners have been destroyed. Uh, by those topics. But bringing them together can be particularly explosive and particularly at this time. As Kim suggested, we're haunted by places and events, as she named them. I recently was in Charleston and made my way over to Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church and uh, stood where th that man uh, went in uh, to join the Bible study and after an hour uh, shot 
and killed uh, nine children of God. And what struck me being there was not what he did, but what that community did, giving us a remarkable example of faith and forgiveness and the pursuit of justice. It, but the interaction of race, faith, and politics is not always uh, someplace else. It's often here. Uh, we're at Georgetown, some of you know the story. It's a great place, uh, doing a lot of great work in this area. But you know the story that in 1838, 272 men, women, and children were sold by the Maryland Jesuits for $115,000. And part of the proceeds of that money was used to pay the debts of this university. Uh, my daughter has been trying to teach me about white privilege. She explained to me that it might be privileged to teach or attend a school that was financially uh, rescued by the sale of other human beings. Uh, this university under the leadership of President DeJoya is wrestling with all that in admissions and curriculum and policy and history. If you visit uh, Dahlgren Chapel on your way out tonight, you will pass by uh, Isaac Hawkins Hall. Uh, Mr. Hawkins uh, was the first name on the list of people who have been sold, the 272. However, he is not the only uh, black man that is honored with the building here. We're in Healy Hall. Uh, you may know that uh, Patrick Healy was a Jesuit. He was the 29th president of Georgetown University following the Civil War. What you may not know, that in 1834, he was born in Macon, Georgia, to an Irish-American plantation owner, Michael Healy, and Mary Elizabeth Smith, an enslaved African-American. After Patrick's father, Michael, bought his mother, he fell in love with her and made her his common law wife, and they had four sons. And since it was illegal for black children or black people to read or write in Macon, Patrick and his brothers were raised in the North, educated there and in Europe, and in 1850 entered the Jesuit order. Although Patrick Healy was identified and accepted as an Irish American during his lifetime, in more recent years, his real ancestry became more widely known and acknowledged. So he, was, he is recognized as the first US citizen of African descent to earn a PhD, to be admitted to the Jesuits, and to be president of a predominantly white college. He was called second, the second founder of Georgetown, and he is buried in a cemetery over there. These interactions of race, faith, and politics are not just legacies of the past, but realities of the present. If you go to the end of this building, named for Patrick Healy, you can look out at Anacostia, less than 10 miles away. The babies born in Anacostia die at twice the rate as the US as a whole, and nearly 10 times the rate of children born here in Northwest Washington. So we're here to talk about the past. We're also here to talk about that present and to see whether race and faith and politics can not only pull us apart, but can engage us and help us um, pull together. And to do that, we have four remarkable leaders. Adele Banks is an editor and award-winning reporter for Religion News Service. She has been a reporter in Florida, Rhode Island, and New York. She won a major award for her coverage of the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. Bishop Flores is a pastor of a diocese on the border. He is a champion of human life and dignity. He served that diocese for 10 years and previously served as an auxiliary bishop in Detroit. Justin Gibney is an attorney and political strategist in Atlanta. He's the co-founder and president of the Ann Campaign, a coalition of urban Christians seeking to bring the compassion and convictions of the gospel to US politics. 
And Jim Wallace, Reverend Jim Wallace is the founder, president, and editor of Sojourners. He is the author of 12 books. Uh, the latest book is Christ in Crisis, Why We Need to Reclaim Jesus. And just by coincidence, we happen to have a few copies of the book uh, that are available for sale and maybe even for a signature. Uh, more importantly, uh, Jim teaches here at Georgetown at the McCord School. So I want to begin by asking these distinguished leaders a question that flows directly from Jim's book. Jim, in this moment of polarization, of tribal behaviors of every kind, tries to take us back to Jesus. And what he does is he poses questions that Jesus asked us or that people asked Jesus. So to begin our conversation, I want to go to a Jesus' question, a biblical question. What does who is my neighbor mean today in the context of faith race, and politics. What are the most important factors shaping the links among faith, race, and politics in our divided nation? And I'd like to begin with you, Adele. As a reporter, if you want to join the conversation, you can do so at hashtag faith, race, and politics. So Adele, who is my neighbor? I'm going to start with the second question. Okay. First. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation, John. I appreciate it. Um, the last time I was in this hall was when I was a reporter, I still am a reporter, covering the very history that John just mentioned. I was here for the, what was called a contrition liturgy related to uh, Georgetown's history, relating to um, the sale of slaves by Jesuits to keep this school going. And um, so I think one of the most important factors for linking faith and race and politics is history. And sometimes people don't want to think about history, but it, remembering it and acknowledging it and figuring out what to do next is very important. Um, I've spent part of this year uh, covering the 400th anniversary of the forced arrival of Africans to enslaved Africans to Virginia. And I've seen how all of these things are connected. And there is disagreement about how much these things are connected. Um, there was a study by Barna that found uh, in June that far more black practicing Christians than white practicing Christians agree that slavery's effects continue today. And so millennials are more likely to agree that there are continuing effects, but older generations are less likely to. So we continue to grapple with that. Some people would argue that history continues to shape how people think. Uh, about a variety of issues because of the history of slavery, whether it's mass incarceration or criminal justice or access to healthcare or housing and to the ballot box. So I think it's important to still remember that. Um, and since I was also asked about the neighbor question, I just want to point out that Public Religion Research Institute has pointed out that although people say they know people across races and across religions, about one in five Americans say they seldom or never interact with someone who does not share their race or their religion. And um, about 23%, uh, a quarter of people, say they seldom or never interact with somebody who doesn't share their political party. So those are some of the challenges we're facing right now. Well, thank you, Adele. Uh, Dell is the journalist, the reporter. She gives us context. Uh, we have a pastor uh, on the border. Sometimes we think of this in terms of black and white. It's obviously more complicated than that. From as a pastor in Brownsville on the border, what does who is my neighbor mean today? Well, it's actually a, a theme upon which I, I preach very frequently. I think it's as I often say, I think that particular question which is posed to Jesus, specifically in the Gospel of Luke, uh, is, is perhaps the pivotal question that must constantly be asked by us all. Uh, you will recall when, 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 when Jesus was asked, first, first, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus gives basically the dialogue, leads him to, to us, you love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, and, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. And then it was a lawyer who asked the question. Remember, I always remember that. <laughs> because, because the next question was, you know, always trying to find, well, okay, let's specify this, then who is my neighbor? Because that becomes the crucial question. 
and it's, it's never to be separated from the fact that Jesus' response to that question is the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's not a legal answer. It's not a, it's not a, a citation of the law of Moses. It is the parable of the Good Samaritan, which in fact raises up the question beyond, beyond the parable and certainly beyond a question of the law, uh, as it has been at that point. This becomes a, a part of the evangelical understanding that the question of the neighbor is the question which, when you really think about the full impact of the Good Samaritan, is the one who's in front of me and is in need, period. There's not a, there's not a, there's not a commentary after that. There's not a, there's not a, 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 a sort of like a, a massaging of the message. And, and that's why, in the detail of the parable you're, of course, familiar with, but it's something we ought to meditate very frequently because that becomes then the criteria by which, certainly in my diocese, when we're dealing with, with immigrant mothers and children, mostly Central American, who have traveled through Mexico, who have had a great deal of difficult time passing through Mexico uh, for, for what could be called class and racial reasons that also affect Latin America quite significantly, and then coming to the, to the border and then, and, then, and then us trying to respond. My, 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 my call to the people of my diocese is, is the neighbor is the one in need in front of us. We'll have to wait for the politicians to figure out how to, how, to, how to solve this, but in the meantime, you have to face the face, the real face of the person in front of you and respond accordingly. And then we can think about how better to, to work the, the, the larger, the more, the more abstracted questions because Jesus' response is not an abstract response. It is a concrete one. And so, so to me, this is the, uh, certainly one of the principal gospels that I'll pre, I find a, almost every Sunday I can find a way to pull this gospel in. <laughs> and, and that's part of the, because it is, I mean, there are certain elements of the gospel. And, and finally, I would just say it's important, uh, especially in the, if you read patristic literature, that the fathers of the church recognized that there, was two, there are two Christological figurations in that parable. It is the Christ who goes out of his way to attend to the one who's suffering, and it is the Christ who is suffering. And that he is, it's a vision of grace that allows you to see reality in that way. And that's something that we have to pray for a lot. Well, Justin, uh, the bishop pointed out it was the lawyer who tried to test Jesus. And he said that uh, we have to help the politicians figure this out. As I understand your work in AND, you're a lawyer, uh, you're an activist, a strategist, and you're trying to help the rest of us push the politicians to answer the question of who is my neighbor in a just and compassionate way. When we say who is my neighbor, what's it look like uh, to the AND coalition? Yeah, I think it, it may just be the person who you would least like to have a political conversation with. Right. So so for me, uh, for me, it could be uh, the the person screaming at me from the opposite side of a political rally. Right. That unemployed Trump uh, supporter from back row America whose family is dealing with the opioid crisis. Right. How do I deal with that conversation? Uh, do I allow my political tribe to character that person? Right. Do I allow them to dismiss that to, to just dismiss that person? I think that becomes in that situation can become your neighbor. And how do we respond to that particular person at that time? Uh, I think it's very important, important that we think of our neighbor, that we think of our political opponents as our neighbors, because it does something very different than how we seem the lens that I think we use today. A lot of times we use this uh, kind of mob mentality politics lens to look at our political opponents. And when you're in a, when you're part of a mob mentality, I think, um, you have, you have comrades and you have enemies, right? And your comrades are always right. Uh, they're always good. Your enemies are always wrong. Your enemies don't necessarily uh, have a story or a testimony. They're just dumb. Uh, they're just ignorant. They're just bigoted. Um, they're irredeemable, right? But how do we have those conversations and recognizing that that person that may need help, that person that Jesus is telling us was our neighbor, might be the person again who we really just want to dismiss, who we really just want to say there's no reason that they have those opinions. We have to get them out of out of the society rather than saying maybe this opioid crisis has something to do with it. What led to that? Maybe your unemployment has something to do with this conversation. 
Now, to be clear, these, your, your political opponents or your neighbor could be someone who is very harmful. It could be someone who's very helpful. So we don't have to pretend that your, your opposition or the person that could be your neighbor is always right. But I do think that, uh, John, I do think that we have to look at the people who we don't want to necessarily talk to and say, I have to take you seriously. I have to see your dignity. And, and then they become to be your neighbor instead of just an enemy who I can push off and say, you know, we just need to get you out of here. Uh, and, and if once we get you out of here, things will be so much better. Thank you. Uh, it was Jesus' question, Jim, but you put it at the front of your book and said it has to be our question. And as we approach uh, the choices we face as a church, as a nation, as human beings, why did you put who is my neighbor as the central, the beginning question in how to reclaim Jesus? It was a lawyer who asked the question of Jesus. And I'm convinced it was a Washington lawyer. <laughs> because I know that tone of voice. Or a political leader. The question was, you know, what do I do to inherit your life? Love God, love your neighbor. He, says, he didn't say, who is my neighbor? Exactly who is my neighbor? He's narrowing who our neighbor is. And the bishop said the Good Samaritan parable was what was pointed to, and I wrestled with that parable. I learned some new things in that parable. And I put this question first because I think this is going to be the primary question in the divisive, hateful, polarized political season we have just entered into. Because no Judeans thought there were good Samaritans. Samaritans are a mixed race. We don't want to anything to do with them. The Samaritans were the other. Jesus chooses the other as his example of the neighbor. How do you love your neighbor? So, of course, the lesson is don't pass by, as some of the religious leaders do. Stop, take your time, energy, your expense, risk, help, come back. All that's good, but it's more than that. This text, if you go deep into it, this text says your neighbor is the one who's different than you. Your neighbor is the one who's different than you. Gustavo Gutierrez in his commentary was very helpful to me. He said, your neighbor is not in your path. You've got to go outside your path to find your neighbor. And the bishop said, deal with the one who's in front of you. The problem is, our neighbors, the one who Jesus says our neighbors, often are not in front of us. We're, I'm from Detroit. You were bishop there. We had a talk back there about how Detroit had its geography racialized. When my dad came back from World War II, naval officer, and GIs like my dad got a GI Bill, and they got FHA loan. They got education in the house. We became middle class. And all the GIs, like him, were the head of three-bedroom ranch house in their neighborhood. No black sailors on his ship got the GI Bill for an FHA loan. Detroit was racialized ge geographically. And so the reason that we don't know people who are different than us, because it's by policy that we're not supposed to. Because what happens when you find your neighbors when when moms and a baseball team start talking about their hopes and fears for their kids, it's bonding. It doesn't happen across racial lines. So this question of the neighbor and how we find our neighbor, you heard a New York Times uh, quote at the, at the opening of this. We've got political leaders who are targeting, not just ignoring, targeting those whom Jesus calls our neighbor targeting, running against them, running against the other, running against the immigrant, running against people of color. The neighbor, if we don't remember Jesus' answer to this question, we're going to be so polarized and paralyzed in this election year. This question to me is at the heart of spiritual survival for this election season. Thank you. Uh, Here's how we're going to proceed. One, I'm supposed to tell you, if you want to join this conversation, do it at 
hashtag faith, race, and politics. Uh, we're going to go back to each of our panelists and ask them uh, to go deeper in light of their own expertise. We have a few questions we're going to talk about among ourselves, and then we're going to come to you and ask you to pose some questions for our conversation, and then we'll uh, pull it together at the end. I want to go back to Adele. Uh, I said and reported that you're a journalist, you've been doing this a, a long time, uh, you've won some awards. You have been among those, in my experience, in the field of religious journalism who connects these things most explicitly, most consistently. I looked up some of the articles. Birmingham Church, 56 years later, to recall bombing with message of love and action. Reparations fund announced by Virginia Seminary with buildings constructed by slaves. Slavery history still affects blacks, half of practicing Christians say in the survey. Uh, your work appears in the Post, in USA Today, and lots of places. You're a graduate of Mount Holyoke. Uh, but I'd like to ask you as somebody who has watched this for a long time, what is new, what is different today? than what you've seen in the past. OK, well, there's a couple of things that uh, come to mind. One is um, that you always have candidates that end up going into churches and faith-based settings to um, curry favor with people they'd like to have vote for them. And it seems uh, amongst the Democratic candidates that there is a more uh, intense effort this time around. And um, from Cory Booker showing up at Mother Emanuel, to um, Joe Biden showing up at 16th Street Baptist, places that have had tragedies um, that relate to our country's racial history. Um, but then you also have many other examples of that happening this time around. Um, the Poor People's Campaign that's led by Reverend William Barber and Reverend um, Theo Harris are um, bringing together people and candidates more than once. In one case, I think it was about nine in Washington at a forum that dealt mostly with issues of poverty, where faith leaders and uh, low-income Americans had a chance to ask candidates questions. And then there have been more than half a dozen who showed up at uh, Al Sharpton's uh, National Action Network annual uh, convention back in April. And then there's a Black Church PAC and Young Leaders Conference where five showed up, and a Native American Presidential Forum where 11 showed up. And so there seems to be uh, recognition that these candidates need to go where people of color are and discuss the things that people of color are concerned about. Um, another thing I'll mention is that for a long time, a lot of different denominations, both conservative and um, more progressive, have issued statements about racial reconciliation and how things need to be better and that kind of thing. And it seems like there may be a move to do more on the action side, um, as the bishop was mentioning, at least more visible showing of concern. I cover the Southern Baptist Convention almost every year, and um, they passed a resolution like in 1995 about racial reconciliation. But this year, for the first time that I can remember, in two different instances, at their pastor's conference, which was the day before, and at their actual regular conference, which is only for two days, they had people on the stage who were African American and who were Caucasian talking about how they should relate to one another, how they could better understand each other, what they can do together in their communities. And that seemed to me to be a, a new juncture. They acknowledge they still have a long ways to go, but it seems like there is movement beyond just words on paper. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm going to go to Justin. Uh, Adele talked about more politicians, more candidates trying to connect faith and politics. Your work, uh, the choices you've made, are an explicit effort to do that. Uh, uh, Justin went to Vanderbilt. I'm told he was the MVP of the Vanderbilt football team. Um, uh, I'm in no position to argue with that. He looks like he could be the MVP. Uh, he uh, worked in a variety of campaigns and causes in Atlanta uh, successfully. Uh, he has, uh, w one of the things I hope you might share is uh, you became a delegate to the Democratic, Democratic Convention, an Obama delegate, and found your faith sort of tested and challenged and affirmed in that process. Uh, one of the things that I read about uh, uh, 
Justin, was uh, a magazine asked if you were to give a panel, moderate a panel on some topic that isn't about your work, what would it be? And your answer was the lie of careerism. It seems to me that for a young uh, political strategist, being a pro-life Democrat is probably not an investment in careerism. Uh, and challenging the party on that question. So my question to you is, with all this new activity in the religious sphere, you have tried, together with Michael Weir and others, put together a movement that brings urban uh, Christians into the political life to stand up for the gospel. Why did you do that? How did you get there? And where is the resistance coming from? Wow. Good question. There's a lot there to unpack. Um, John, I think the, the biggest thing that the AND campaign is trying to do is really help people center, at least help Christians, center the gospel in their public witness. One of the things that we say a lot, John, is that your political party should not be the master of your social action. So now if my political party is the master of my social action, there's no way in the world that I say a thing about abortion. There's no way in the world that I say a thing about religious liberty. But my faith tells me that's something that I have to talk about. Right? That's something that I have to, you know, that's, those are issues that regardless of what party I'm, I'm in, that's not really the consideration. The consideration is what's faithful. And I think too often one of the problems that we have is that we've allowed our, our political affiliation to become religious in nature, right? So that our tribe, our, our political party are really controlling us and sometimes on moral issues more than our faith is controlling us on moral issues because we want to be on the team. I read a, and I wish I had the, the exact um, research, but I read some data that basically said some of the most educated voters in America make decisions not based on principle, but make decisions based on identity and basically their ideological tribe. So when your tribe takes a left, you take a left. When your tribe takes a right, you take a right. And we're, we're trying to challenge both sides, right? So we, we would go to, <laughs> a, you know, maybe a conservative white evangelical. And we would say, you have to deal with the reality of, of, of systemic racism and what racism has done to this country. You have to deal with that. You have to come into that conversation, not trying to defend yourself and make sure that nobody thinks that anyone around you or you is responsible for it, because that's sometimes how we walk into those situations. I have to leave here making sure that you don't think I'm liable or guilty of any of this stuff. But really walk into that conversation with humility and say, where have we gone wrong? Do I really understand the history? I, I'm glad that uh, uh, Jim brought up the GI Bill. That's a huge issue. And when you talk about things like that, you're talking about generational wealth, right? When you go back to slavery, you, you're talking about, do people see work differently? Why do some people see work as just somebody trying to get over on you and others see it as a huge opportunity, right? These things go back to, 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 to issues like that. But, when, but then we also wanna make sure, and we also talk a lot about Jim, challenging your own side and challenging your own party, right? We, I, I'm in a party right now in the Democratic Party where we have, we have people that, that basically uh, were on the Judicial Committee and asked Christ, and basically said that Christians can't be judges because of some of their beliefs. And the fact that that could happen and not raise huge issues, it wasn't huge news. We didn't see it all over CNN. We didn't see it all over M M MSNBC. We didn't see a lot of pastors in urban communities who are very biblical, who are conservative on a lot of social issues. We didn't see them say anything. And so what the AND campaign try is trying to do, myself along with Michael Ware, is make sure that we're asking those questions, make sure that we're being critical and placing faith really above the partisanship and the ideology. Bishop, if you were to pick two places which are sort of uh, ground zero for race, faith, and politics, Brownsville and Detroit would be in the top 10. And you've been a pastor in both. You've been a lot of other things. You've been, you went to the Angelicum. You uh, were in seminary work. You were uh, a chancellor, a vicar general. You've been rector of a cathedral. Uh, you, you have served in lots of ways. Uh, you have a wonderful Episcopal motto. I took Latin, but I'm not gonna repeat it. The word is sent forth, sent breathing forth love. The other part, you're a successor of the apostles, but your Twitter handle is Amigo de Frodo. Uh, uh, which, uh, how can you befriend the little man 
when you're a pastor in a community where all those contradictions happen. Uh, Justin talked about people whose faith shapes their politics. I assume there's none of that going on in Brownsville. That uh, there are a lot of Catholics who read the Good Samaritan and they don't feel uh, compelled to think about the folks who come to Brownsville looking for a better life. And there are others in Brownsville who think that their identity is more important than their faith. How can you be a pastor? How can you proclaim the gospel in a society divided by race and ethnicity and immigration? Wow. Um, I just want to kind of pick up, because I really appreciate what Justin just said, and I, I very much sense that, that, that that's kind of the, the same mind that I've been trying to approach both in Detroit and when I was there and also in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, you may know uh, that, that the Diocese of Brownsville, I mean, Brownsville is as far south as you can get without crossing the Rio Grande River and being in Mexico. And so it is the reality of the border, which is a long history, and history continues to affect that reality. In, but, but what Justin was saying about, about calling the church to, um, to, to let the gospel be the lens by which we interpret reality and not let sort of like the partisan sort of elements, I mean, I, I, I agree, politics has been taken on religious overtones, partisan identity takes on that. Um, some sports almost reach that level, but it's that kind of loyalty which sees everything through that lens. And, and, a, and a fundamental baptismal call is to allow the gospel, but you gotta give it time in your own life and in the community to kind of transform your vision. It is a transforming grace, but it doesn't happen unless you, you, you invite the Lord and the Holy Spirit to kind of happen, let that happen in your heart. So in working with the community, you, you, you kind of preach that and, and, and you kind of say, you know, you know, Cristo es el Rey, you know, Christ is the King and we have to let him be the one who informs our vision. And that means, I mean, I do simple things. I, I, I constantly ask the people of God, I, I visit the parishes, we have a lot of them, um, and, and I encourage people, you know, the people say, what can I do? You need to read the gospel every day. The, the eclipse of Christ as the figure by which we, to which we, from whom we seek the wisdom to understand reality and human life and the human, and the human condition and also human dignity is, is, is what I consider most devastating to what is, is sort of opening us up to this sort of divisiveness, this sort of, because, because if, you lose, if you lose that fundamental announcement, the most radical thing that was ever written was, and the word was made flesh, which means flesh becomes bearer of the word and, that, and the word was God and that, and you can't get around that when you're dealing with your neighbor and you can't, and you can't get around that unless you choose to forget it or not think about it. Or, and so it's important that we kind of, we kind of do that. I learn, uh, I'll send you about the Miguel the Frodo thing. I think, you know, Jesus said a lot and, and we have to read the gospel every day. But one of the things he said not, not too long ago in one of the gospels on Sunday was, was exactly the fact, you know, make friends with the poor because they're the ones who are gonna judge you. I don't know that we take that seriously. We, we don't take eschatology seriously enough because Jesus says some very definite things about what the judgment will be about. And we, don't, and we don't see ourselves moving in that direction and we kind of think it's nice poetic language when he talks that way, but I take it very seriously. Make friends with the people who have no power uh, because they're the ones with whom the word chose to identify himself when he became flesh. And we have to find some way to kind of get that message out and then, <laughs> Because the kingdom of God is too big a mystery to fit into any political party in the history of the human race, much less the two that we have now. And so we have to let that lens be that which, which we challenge the party. I tell people, you can belong to a party, but you have to let the gospel be the conscience by which you challenge the leadership of the party to think differently, because Jesus always wants the circle to be larger than, the, than Caesar would like it to be. And, and, and we have to be willing to kind of push that. Now, so I, I, I do, I, I, I would say this, uh, maybe because it's on my mind, you know, uh, I don't know about the rest of the country, I don't get to Washington very often, but the Rio Grande Valley is a great place, you ought to come and visit it. And what I tell people is, if you go and you, you speak to immigrant mothers and children and you talk to them and you ask them what life is like and you just actually let them talk and listen, it changes your vision. Instead of just talking about them and at them, and kind of deciding kind of what is supposed to be right for them, actually talk about what's the experience, what's the reality, why did you leave? Most people would prefer to stay in their home 
I mean, it's not true that everybody wants to live in the United States. Most people in Latin America would say it's a nice place to visit, but it wouldn't want to live there. Because people love their own place. And so we have to ask, you have to get into the, you see, the flesh is very concrete. It's historical. It has situations. It has circumstances. And that's where Jesus is. We abstract him. As Pope Benedict used to say, we make him into an idea. And then we can take him apart. You know, he's like the scarecrow after the flying monkeys got to him. He's like, he's got pieces over there and pieces over there. And so, I don't know, I just think there's a, there's a constant, there's no f short fix. You have to preach the gospel and you have to encourage people because the kingdom is amongst us if you have the eyes to see, but the eyes to see are a grace and you have to, you have to ask for it. That's probably more than you ask for, but that's what I'll say. Uh, the bishop said uh, he was happy he's not in Washington. Uh, Jim, you are. Uh, uh, we've been friends and colleagues for a long time. We work together on the Circle of Protection, which tries to stand up for the poor and vulnerable in the budget process and public policy. Had remarkable uh, success in difficult times. Uh, Jim is a baseball coach and has written 12 books. I don't know how you do those two things at once. You know him as the president, the editor-in-chief, and the founder of Sojourners. Uh, he's married to a priest, I want to add, an Episcopal priest uh, in this setting. He has two boys. And I'm really struck. The bishop said what we ought to do is read the gospel every day and look at the world through the eyes of Christ. Your book says we ought to look at politics through the words of Jesus. Why did you decide that? And how do Jesus' questions test us today in Washington as we approach this election? I'm really struck by, Justin, the name of your movement, the AND movement. In the earliest days of sojourners, AND was likely our most common word. We were for personal faith and social justice. We were for prayer and peacemaking. We were for worship and action. So I love, uh, here's a radical idea, John. What if we allowed our faith and values to shape our politics instead of the other way around? That's what we're facing now. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said the question is always, uh, who is Jesus Christ for us today? Who is Jesus Christ for us today. I was wrestling with these questions. Uh, for example, uh, what is truth? Pilate's in a debate with Jesus. He's losing the debate. And so he says, okay, well, what is truth? The Washington Post keeps track of all the lies that are told uh, in this city by this administration. The lies are not the deeper issue. The deeper issue is they want you to think there's no truth. Autocrats always do. There is no truth. Washes his hands and kills Jesus, he does. Washes his hands, fake news. There's no truth. When there is no truth, you just believe what the autocrat says. Jesus says, uh, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Jesus says, be not afraid. Eight times he said, be not afraid. We've got politics now running on fear. Be afraid. Be afraid. Be afraid. So I would say, don't go left. Don't go right, go deeper. And if we're followers of Jesus, and actually I want to say for, this could be an interfaith crowd, uh, my rabbi and imam friends actually feel more comfortable when Christians talk about Jesus. They feel less scared, right? Uh, and a lot of people outside the churches are still very interested in this brown-skinned Jewish rabbi who was born in occupied Palestinian territory. So let me be, be blunt and maybe controversial a bit with um, it, language that may sound irreverent, but it's, it's biblical. I want to say that white nationalism is not just racist, it's antichrist. We need to name that. The dehumanization of immigrants isn't just lack of compassion, it's antichrist. To treat women in the way, to mistreat women, sexual harassment and assault, this is not just sexist, it's antichrist. We're gonna be facing in this election 
the imperfectness of our politics is very clear. Candidates and parties, and you and I know that well. But in terms of values and moral choices, we're going to be facing antichrist politics versus what we think the politics of Jesus are. For that, I got to go back to these questions. And I, what belongs to Caesar and what doesn't? Why did Jesus say, blessed are the peacemakers? Why does he call them the children of God? So these questions I've been wrestling with now. And this is the best way. We're not going to get healing or even solutions by just staying with politics. We're going to have to go deeper and higher. And if I'm a follower of Jesus, I want to, as we said in my evangelical tradition a long time ago, get back to Jesus. That's what we have to do. Thank you. Uh, I would ask you, if you want, to join the conversation at hashtag faith, race, politics. Let me throw two questions at the group, and then we'll turn to you. And uh, one is, how is faith misused by believers, by political leaders, by institutions on questions of race and politics? That's the first one, and we'll go through that. The second question is, what are examples of where faith transformed, engaged, converted uh, us on questions of race and politics? So first, the negative. How are believers, how are our politicians, how is our culture misusing faith when it comes to questions of racial justice and uh, political uh, choices. Yeah, I guess I'll take that. Um, I think one way it's misused, I think, on the right is, you know, when you talk about racial, in I mean, yeah, on the right, sometimes when you talk about racial injustice, uh, you'll hear people say, hey, we're, we're, we're Christians, God will take care of it. You know, that's just something that, you know, God will handle, let him take care of it. Um, and so we're using faith to dismiss an issue that's very serious or, or say, we don't have to deal with that. And I just think that's a, a you know, that's, that's just not biblical. I think that's terrible theology uh, because we see all through the Bible that God is a God of justice and that he uses his people to do his bidding and to do, do justice. So if we are servants uh, of, of God, of a God of justice, then obviously would, we would serve that purpose. Uh, and the interesting thing about pe when people say that is usually those are the people who don't say that about abortion, or they don't say that about religious liberty, right? So we kind of pick and choose what issues we'll say, hey, I'll let God handle that, I have nothing to do with it, and then we take up others. Uh, and just, a, just social justice in general, I mean, to hear uh, evangelicals or people who are biblical Christians say that they don't want to deal with so the, a social justice conversation, I just think it's false. Because everybody in here today believes in social justice. No, nobody in this room is going to allow one of their kids to mis be mistreated at school. You're not going to allow somebody in your family uh, to, to go, at, go to jail uh, unlawfully or go to jail when they shouldn't be in jail. You would say something about that. You're not going to let your children drink poison water, lead poison water. It's because you believe in social justice. You believe that there's a standard that society should set for how people should be treated based off human dig dignity, based off the Imago Dei. And so I think when we use religion to say, hey, let's not worry about that issue or, you know, the immigrants on the border. Let's I don't want to be Christian on that conversation. Right. I want to be Christian on other issues. I don't want to be Christian on that one or, or whatever the faith may be. I think that's harmful. And, you know, to use the word as a cop out, uh, I think is just um, is, is, is sad. Well, in fact, what they do is they say uh, you're going political right, right, right. or divisive. Right. So a journalist like Adele, who you know, asked me yesterday, what do you do about these churches, the pastors and Christian musicians, who say, I can't talk about social justice issues because it'll divide my congregation, polarized, politicized, it'll divide. And so I can't divide people. So I, I got thinking after I talked to him about the passage that for me brought me to Christ, Matthew 25. This is the final, the, the final test of discipleship, I call it in the book. Jesus' last, last sermon before he goes into the city. And, and so I imagine what if Jesus had said, 
Okay, um, I was gonna talk about the hungry, thirsty, naked, stranger, immigrant, those in prison, sick, but I'm afraid that would be too politically divisive. <laughs> so I'm gonna stay away from those things. I'm gonna tell you how I can get you to heaven. And of course, I'll talk about abortion and gay marriage as well if you want, that's fine. He didn't say that. This was, this was the it was me text. That's what this text said to me. I was hungry, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was a stranger. The word there means immigrant, it means refugee. That's what the word in Greek means. I was in prison. And as you did it to them, the least of these, you did it to me. And, and in the scriptures, the prophets always hold not just the believers, but political leaders, rulers, kings, responsible for this, how they treat the most vulnerable. That's the test. Um, and so, and some of us think that vulnerability is the test of even these controversial questions like abortion. Yeah, women who are in that situation are very vulnerable. And so is the unborn life in the womb. There are two vulnerable populations here, not just one. One the left picks, one the right picks. How do we get to Jesus' politics here? And I want to, the least of these are most ignored in this town. John talked about what we do with the circle of protection. We have fought for the least of these, John, in the White House with Democrat and Republican presidents, both parties. In this town, they ignore the least of these. Now the least of these are being targeted, deliberately targeted, the hungry, the sick, being targeted. So if we care about Jesus, the least of these have to be at the center of our political agenda. And don't say it'll be divisive and political. Uh, why has that happened? Our politics are more important to us than our faith. So this is what can get into this polarized debate if we can say, how are the least of these doing? That's a gospel issue, as you were saying, Bishop. That's not a political issue. And that holds both parties accountable who don't want to talk about the poor and the vulnerable. I'm sure, Bishop, this is the first time anyone suggested those matters are divisive. How do, how do you encourage your pastors and your people to uh, try and bring the gospel into uh, a democracy? Well, the gospel impacts directly um, human relations. Jesus had a lot to say about the neighbor and also our relationship to God the Father. And, 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 and so as soon as you're talking about the human relation, you're talking sooner or later about the polis, you're talking about the state, you're talking about how we live together and whether, and whether we get along together or we don't. And so it seems to me if you're simply preaching the gospel and you talk about its human impact and how we're supposed to, to look at one another, it has political consequences. And, I, you know, I don't tell people how to vote, but I do say I really hope you think about this when you're voting. And I'm talking about the gospel when I say this and not and not and not cut it into pieces. And I want to say just two quick points. I think I think we have to be also realistic about American history. And that is we have used civil religion for a long time. We and, and some some in the history of the country have used it well. Lincoln was particularly good at that. Uh, in, a, in a world where religious diversity has been with us from the beginning. And so part of the reality is we do not have a consensus in the country as to what Jesus really means. This is, this is so fundamental that it's hard for even, and so it should also make us particularly skeptical about any political party that sort of, that sort of like um, captures Jesus for its own because it's always going to be a certain civil religion because because that's kind of the way the constitution set it up but but the but the but it's a testimony to the fact that even the political order recognizes that religion is very important in how people live it continues to be but i think i think i think you know just recognize that 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 the use of civil religion can then contribute to the divisiveness with which the religion which is appropriated is used it's just a reality it's been with us for a long time and I, I just, we need to be historically accurate about that and, and, and perhaps we could look at it. But I also think the consensus issue is particularly, Charles Taylor talks a lot about that, about what's happened to, to just the, the, the multiplicity of religious confession in a country like the United States. So it's very hard. And so that is a, 
Now, I think each of us, and I think the, that's why in a certain way the ecumenical movement is quite important because we have to find a consensus in some way about the impact of the figure of Jesus from the faith perspective. I'm mean, not saying we're going to agree about everything. I have a certain idea about what, what kind of the, the implicit Catholic spirit of the gospel is in terms of pulling people together and into, uh, into the, the grand communion, which ultimately becomes, you know, the, the, the singing of the saints around the, the lamb that is slain. But, but, there's a, but we need to kind of at least deal with that and be rather suspicious. And maybe we should just ask the politicians not to quite invoke Jesus quite as much as they do. That's the best way I've ever heard we're the one true church described. <laughs> I'm willing to have uh, the, uh, the, I think uh, you heard more than I said, uh, there, John. Uh, uh, that Catholic spirit. Adele, I don't want to put you on the spot. You're a reporter, not an advocate. Uh, as you watch this, where are believers uh, doing the right things, and where in your reporting are they doing things that push people away? That's a good question. Um, and I'm going to follow through quickly, ask the others for a sign of where faith is making things better, and then we're going to go to questions from the audience. I can give you one example um, that I found that I wrote about related to a LifeWay research study, and it talked about um, the reasons that both black and white young adults choose to step away from church. They may go off to college and have all these other reasons, but about 28% of white young adults and 18% of black young adults said their church's stance on social and political issues is what might cause them to stay away. So I think people who are grappling with all these issues of race and politics and faith may handle them in such a way that they lose the people in the pews that they care about and that they're grappling to hold on to as people struggle with trying to keep young people in church. So I think that when they don't do it right, however that is, that they're gonna lose the people that will help them continue to exist. Any example of something you've covered that uh, is an example of confronting race in a way that uh, heals rather than divides? Well, the thing that comes to mind immediately is a story from a long ago, but it still is a good example, I think. And that was, um, I've written about uh, efforts for churches to become more multiracial. And I remember going to a church that had succeeded in that and um, interviewing the woman who was part of the first black family to join. And she said, she realized, she thought about not doing it. She thought about just going on to some other church, but she said, well, somebody had to be first. And so that was the sense that the working together and realizing again this whole notion of everybody being your neighbor that even though people might not all look like you, that doesn't mean you can't worship together. Jim, you talked powerfully about Antichrist. Where is an example of Christ in action today in the religious community on race or politics? You know, to pick up on what Adele said, uh, I was in the, with a bunch of students just uh, last week here in town, interns. And uh, they all were formally this or formally that, or they left or I was raised this way. And it was the hypocrisy they felt in their religion and the lack of response to massive injustice. That was, but, but the exciting thing was when we got talking about this Jesus and these questions, the room lit up, just lit up. And they wanted to engage in this. And uh, it struck me that Jesus has somehow survived all of us Christians. <laughs> which is a really wonderful thing. But I remember, uh, you, know, you know, John Fife, Presbyterian pastor, way out in the Southwest uh, years ago, he, he called me and he said, well, I, 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 a lawyer came to our door and said there are these refugees from El Salvador in the desert and they're dying. He said, I didn't know where El Salvador was, but I thought I should go and see what was going on. And uh, John went out, cowboy boot, Presbyterian pastor, and he found these refugees, and he began the sanctuary movement. And he and a Catholic sister put the whole thing together, and he, he was then named as, as a felon, a felon for doing this. And I went to his trial and talked to him. I said, I said John, why did you do this? And he said, well, I was reading that Matthew 25 thing, you know, <laughs> and it just... Uh, and, and when young people see uh, Christians or faith le leaders 
at, young people are looking for courage, looking for courage. And when they see people act in courage and put themselves on the line or take a risk for what they believe in, it really stirs up stuff. It brings people back. So I love talking to the nuns, you know, the none of the above. I love the nuns, you know. I mean, I love the nuns, the other nuns, too. When I, when I go out to speak to these evangelical colleges years ago, we started, there'd be two rows of Catholic sisters in the, in the front. And I'd say, sisters, why are you here? They'd say, well, we're localists. Yeah, but why are you here? Well, Jim, this is a very conservative place. Said, yeah, that's why I came. We thought somebody should have your back. So, so I've had nuns for bodyguards for years. But, but the N-O-N-E-S, I like these young people. They do, they, they're not affiliating. I don't want to affiliate, but they, they believe in God. And they really are drawn to Jesus. And so there are little mini mega churches. There are little mini churches all over the country, little circles of people who are talking about how to follow Jesus. I'm encouraged by what I see. I'm uh ask that the microphone be set up for questions, and if you have a question, uh, get mine, and I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Justin and then the bishop, where's a sign of where faith has uh, healed and pursued justice as opposed to push people away? Justin? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I like where, where Jim took it. Um, I, I see some emerging, my, you know, my encouragement comes from some of the emerging leaders that I see that are talking about this differently. Uh, Michael Ware, we talked about C.J. Rhodes, Dr. C.J. Rhodes in, in Mississippi, um, Jackie Hill Perry in Atlanta. These are people who are going to usher in, I think, some of the nuns or some of the folks who are more agnostic because they love the church and they love Jesus so much that they're not going to quit on it. Um, that they're not going to say, I'm not going to come to church because somebody else did Christianity wrong, therefore I'm not going to participate. Um, and I think the way that they can articulate to different audi audiences the importance of justice. The idea that, that, that justice is a moral conversation, right? That it is, and I think one of the, some of the more morality movements, one of the things they missed is that injustice is immoral. And so if you have a, a more majority movement or a, a values movement that does not have a justice component to it, then it is not a moral movement then it will uh, be susceptible to kind of uh, coupling itself with bigotry, coupling itself with greed and things of that nature. And so when I see some of these kind of emerging leaders coming across and boldly and biblically really uh, preaching the gospel and talking about how the justice plays a part to, you know, Southern Baptist churches, to traditional uh, black Baptist churches and, and all around, it is really encouraging and, and having that focus to say, I'm not afraid of politics. Yes, politics is dirty, and that's exactly why we need to be in there to, to, to disinfect and to clean it up. It's, it's really encouraging. Bishop. I, I think it's very important, one of the points that Pope Francis consistently makes, and that is that uh, the most creative things in the, in the grace of the kingdom that kind of happen historically come from basically the work of the people of God. And I can testify to that. Um, just to kind of briefly run through, about six years ago, before it was on the news, before it was on Kenny Cable Network, um, just regular folks in, in the Rio Grande Valley noticed that there were mothers and children in obvious distress waiting at bus stations. And they started stopping by and asking them. They were parishioners from some of the local parishes, San Cristobal de Magallanes, several parishes, and they basically stopped, which is very Samaritan-like, good Samaritan-like, went out of their way and stopped and said, ¿En qué le puedo ayudar? How can I help you? And then they began to hear the story, well, we, were just, we just passed through immigration control because they'd get vetted, and we'd been left at the bus station. No, we don't speak English. How do we get, you know, we're supposed to get a bus ticket, and we're supposed to go to, uh, to our family in Chicago because the whole world has a cousin in Chicago. <laughs> and so, and so they, had, they hadn't taken a shower since they left Central America. They hadn't had, you know, a decent meal. Yes, they'd eaten something, but, you know, and so, they, so basically the people of God take food by, they start taking water, they start taking little, little tennis shoes because they needed new shoes. And, and then, and this is before anybody knew this was happening. So there's a benefit, I believe, to being a diocese that's fairly poor because we are fairly poor. We don't have a huge bureaucracy. Um, and so what happens is word gets to Sister Norma. You might know Sister Norma. She's kind of the, the Catholic charity's like superwoman down there. And so she calls me. She says, Bishop, we have a problem. We have these families. And so do we have a building we can, you can let me use for a couple of days? And I say, 
Sure, sister, let me call the pastor of Sacred Heart. He's a Franciscan. Well, they have a hall, so, so we'll open up the hall. And so I call the pastor. I said, Father, let me borrow your hall for a couple of weeks because we have to, we want to have a place to take these mothers and children and give them a shower and, and give them some hot, and then help them figure out what their bus ticket says and when to go. And so like, like three, and four years later, I was still using the hall and we had served, you know, by that point, 80,000 people. But that all came from the response, and see, this is what a pastor wants to see in his people. Uh, that, that's what it means to enculturate the faith. It's an automatic response that sees and then, then, and then responds uh, in, some, in some act of, 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 of charity, justice, that kind of says, how can I help you? Th this, is, this, is, this, is, this is very promising because I'll readily admit this, the best ideas I have ever had as a bishop came from somebody else, and it was usually from people who were already doing something on the ground. And I think we have to be much more attentive to how that's working, and I think Pope Francis is kind of pointing in that direction. That's a great example of an immediate response. Let me just add a specific one. The, the only bipartisan issue left in Washington is development assistance around the world, feeding the hungry, caring for people with HIV AIDS. The Trump administration every time says, let's cut this, foreign aid's terrible, it's wasteful, da, da, da. And Republicans and Democrats together say, that's nuts. Uh, they, uh, PEPFAR, we had lunch, a couple of us with Michael Gerson yesterday, started by President Bush, continued and invested in by President Obama. They try and cut it, and Democrats and Republicans say, no, we're not going there. Uh, it used to be that uh, it was impossible to stand up for foreign aid, and now it's impossible to cut foreign aid. And I would argue it's the religious community working with others, CRS and World Vision and others. Uh, three days ago, the President of the United States, uh, let's identify, it's a man named Trump, uh, said, we're only going to have 18,000 refugees this year. The religious community across the board said, that's unacceptable. That's not who we are. That's not taking care of people who are persecuted, whether they be Christian or Muslim or others. So there are examples where people have stood up. There's a woman uh, ready to ask our panel a question. Please identify yourself. I'll say what I always say. Please put your question in the form of a question. Um, hi, my name is Tony Cross. I'm a cradle Episcopalian, so I love this kind of stuff. Um, would actually love to see this um, conversation in an interfaith setting um, with representatives from different religions as well. But um, Ms. Banks brought up the point about um, needing to create more multicultural churches. And I read Reverend Wallace's book, um, America's Original Sin, um, where you discussed that. And I was wondering if you had seen any progress on that front um, since you released the book, and if not, what ordinary Christians and faith communities can do to kind of bring that um, vision to reality. Who wants to take that one? Well, you asked if I'm seeing progress on that. Uh, we're seeing a reversal of that in the last few years. We're seeing uh, black Christians leaving uh, even multicultural churches and white churches to go back to protect themselves in their own churches. Uh, when, they, when they hear the way an administration talks about who is wanted in this country and who is not, and that's being very clear, people are trying to protect themselves, which I understand. So part of it is, is, is what are we going to do together to confront those things? In other words, if the image of God is real to us, if we believe that, then any time they want to suppress somebody's vote because of the color of their skin, or as North Carolina said in the court language, uh, voter suppression surgically targeted at African Americans. That is a violation of the image of God. That's, that's throwing away a Mago Dei. So what if we had uh, white pastors and black pastors in this election season, uh, whether they're in the same churches yet or not, 
What if they went to the secretaries of state in the states where we have voter suppression all the time and said, we want a fair and free election where every citizen gets to vote because we think we're all made in the image of God and uh, we, uh, we hope you do too and we're going to help you and we're watching you. And what if collars came in with lawyers at polling places and with those long lines, Bishop, yeah, we got food, we got water, we got, we got, we're going to help you stay in line. They, keep, they moved the polling place yesterday to keep you, you, you from voting where we're going to. So what if, what if we work together on those things? It's not just being in the same building and worshiping together. That's, we have a whole conversation about that. How that is working in some places and how it's still just, you know, every other month we have a different preacher or choir come in. But what if we were working together on the places where the gospel is literally at stake in our communities? What if, what if uh, we were worked together on those issues? That, I think, over time would bring us together to worship together once we start taking action together on the things that Jesus tells us to care about. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm Megan. I'm with Franciscan Mission Service. I spent the last year and a half as a... I'm looking at the audience because I'm going to challenge you as part of my question. I spent the last year and a half as a prep cook in two different kitchens in uh, southern West Virginia. And I believe God sent me there. And I got to know a bunch of Trump's fans and people that were ambivalent against Trump. And I think it was one of the best witnesses I've ever done. And I didn't even really know I was a Catholic when I did it. But um, I bring that up because I'm just going to make a personal challenge to everybody here to really take to heart what Justin suggested, because I believe it's like the core of where we're, we're at. You know, we've demonized some folks that have maybe arguably some not good information, but they are some lovely people down there. I'll tell you that right now. So I encourage everybody in this room to think about how they can reach across that divide even in a little way and get to know some of these folks that believe so differently than we do. So anyway, that said, I'm supposed to have a question. I was listening. Okay. Hard to tell, but I was. Um, Justin, I wonder if you or anybody else want to speak to ways that you've seen people reach across that divide. Yeah, I think one of the best ways to reach across that divide is just defending people. Right. I think uh, people of faith should always be ready to defend either the defenseless or people that just need a defense. And so it can be in conversation. Right. It can be through through uh, social action. But but finding ways, not just having the having it come up to you and give you finding opportunities to defend people that you normally would not defend and to your around your tribe to kind of set straight some of the narratives and uh, some of the ways that we mistreat people. Um, whether, the, whether these people agree with you or not. So, I, yeah, I would just say finding ways to defend people that you usually wouldn't take that opportunity to defend. I, I, quick, I was having lunch with two members of my family who shall remain nameless, and one of them said, I cannot believe these Trump people. How could they do this? Blah, 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 blah. And the other member of my family was getting really quiet at, the, at lunch. And I said, I don't even know anybody who voted for him. And I said, I think you may. <laughs> I think you may be related to somebody. And uh, maybe instead of avoiding religion and politics and Thanksgiving, we ought to talk about religion and politics and Thanksgiving. Thank you, very Bishop. If I could make just one quick, I think it's very important. Um, I think one of the things I, I, I ask folks to do back home is don't, don't limit your friendships to people who agree with you because you'll be very lonely sooner or later. And you really, I think we do this and we're often unconscious. You know, we only kind of hang around people who think like we do and, that's, and, that, and that's, 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 that's creating kind of the silo even without even wanting to. Uh, <laughs> you could enjoy the beauty of human friendship with a variety of opinions and a variety of very passionately held things. And this can open up your perspective because it's really hard to demonize somebody that you actually 
like. And I, I've said this before. I think it's hard. On, I think I think the modern world thinks it's more of a miracle that Jesus actually liked people than that he loved them. And I think we need to kind of start from the stance of likability as something that you have to kind of work on developing and sort of cultivating friendship. And that, that cuts across religious lines and, and political lines and even, and, even, and even sports team lines. So, Go Nats. Uh, <laughs> please join us. I'm a little shorter. Pull so that all the way down. Do it like that. Um, this question is also for Justin. You are from Georgia. I am from Louisiana. These are both states in the very deep south. Uh, which we both know is very religious and also very Republican. And a lot of times in this area, it's the Republican Party is heavily associated with religion and God and Jesus, despite the fact that this conversation has proved that Jesus does not belong to any political party. However, in the Deep South, it still is a reality. And I was wondering, as a political strategist, how would you suggest that members from all different types of parties try to convince people in these areas that are so religious and also so Republican that God doesn't belong to the Republican Party. There's a policy that, say, the leader of the party is trying to implement that is antichrist and demonizes an entire group of people that that is not godlike, and you don't have to support that despite the fact that you identify as a Republican. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, the first thing I try to do, and really for both sides, and in Georgia, it, sometimes it does deal with a lot of Republicans, is... Challenge, challenge Christians to at least have three things that they know of that are unchristlike in their party, right? If you, here's the issue. If you agree with everything that conservatives say on every single issue or everything that progressives say on every single issue, I hate to tell you, but we're being, you're being very intellectually lazy and you're gonna be easily manipulated if that's where you're at. And so I challenge them with that. And then I say, if you're a thoughtful voter, you should at least have three to five things that you can say, this in my party is not okay. And I need to push back on that party. Otherwise, you're just an accomplice. And, and we're, we're, we're to be cross bearers. We're to, we're to think critically. We're to uh, look at the situation. And the truth of the matter is, you're, gonna have a, you're probably going to be more impactful when you're correcting your side of the conversation sometimes than when you're yelling at the other side who's probably not even listening to you at that moment. So I think we just have to challenge people to let them know you're smarter than to be a person that agrees with everything somebody else tells you. And that gets them kind of thinking about, yeah, I do need to do a little bit better. So that's kind of how I start with that. Yeah. I think we need to do, you just talked about the narrative that uh, Republicans own uh, religion, God, Jesus, and Democrats don't care. That narrative is, as you said, so well, so wrong for so many reasons. It's ironic to me that the core base of the Democratic Party, the core base is probably African-American women. So the core base of that party is the most religious population in the country, and yet Democrats are reluctant to speak about faith. That's a really, I, so this goes both ways. Uh, I fought religious fundamentalists most of my life, but there also are secular fundamentalists. Mm. Uh, who are very hostile and really finally in the end are disrespectful to their core base in the Democratic Party. There's a lot of patronizing that I think is racial that's going on on the white left. So those are tough questions. But again, I want to get to that more biblically than just politically. So we're at Sojourners, we're, having, we're doing podcasts with Democratic candidates and asking them how their faith and their values shape their priorities and their policies. We've done two already, we're doing more, we're gonna release them soon. Uh, we're talking about faith forums in the fall, or that other fall, uh, with candidates. But when I look at the salt and light issues in the Bible, I always thought I figured that out, salt, light. And I saw some new stuff, and I'll just be brief here, but this really was, it struck me. Salt and light, are not the same. Salt is a preservative. Salt is preserving things that are important to sustain a society. The glue, the common good, uh, values, trust, fidelity, loyalty, relationships, uh, covenantal relationships, um, community. 
those are things that the best of conservatism, not corporatized conservatives, not militarized, the best of conservatism wants to preserve communal values that are necessary for sustaining life. That's the best. So conservatives really like that when we are providing salt and light in our communities. But light shines on stuff that's wrong. It illuminates what uh, is, is, is just, as somebody said, shouldn't be acceptable anymore, right? And every new generation has the, the obligation to say what ha that's been tolerable for so long, we're saying is no longer tolerable. So a new generation doing that with climate and guns and all the rest, progressives like light, sort of like salt, we are both salt and light. If we really got that clear, we could speak to both conservatives and progressives about this faith in Jesus, which isn't right or left. Okay. Can we ask the, the two people left in line to come up and both share your question, and then we'll ask the panel to respond. Um, hi, my name is Ana Ruiz. I'm a sophomore in the SFS, and I'm also a student in Professor Carr's class. Um, my sure question- Sign up for you get credit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very important. Yeah. Um, my question is for Bishop Flores. Um, how do you see um, hybridity and changing identities, such as like second and third generation immigrants or DACA recipients, for example, play a role or affecting the conversation in um, defining race, faith, and politics? Is that obviously changes over generations and how you identify? Okay. Um, and then, hi, I'm Anya. I'm also a sophomore in the SFS. Um, then my question is, you guys have um, brought up how there's a breach in the Christian church in uh, racial equality, but how do you as um, faithful, a uh, faithful community um, combat the increase in Islamophobia and anti-Semitism um, that has been perpetuated by a leader that many white evangelicals have voted for? Okay. One was directed to you, and then uh, they asked other panel, oh, we, and we have one more. Come on up. Welcome. Hello. I just wanted to, uh, my name is Michael Sims. I study aging and health at the uh, college, Georgetown, uh, a graduate program. Um, I just had a question from uh, curiosity uh, to ask of any of the panelists um, what you would find, actually, OK, I promise I'll ask this as a question, just a little bit of backstory. Um, I've read a little bit also from Arthur Brooks and his talking about love your enemies and the, distinguish, the distinction he makes between anger and contempt. Anger being that which still exists in the context of preserving and maintaining and restoring relationship and then contempt being anyone who thinks different from me is inherently evil and stupid and wrong. So I just, had some rec had a question as to any suggestions any of you guys would have for how to draw the line between anger and contempt in the presence of maintaining the relationships in our faith. Okay. Let's go down the line. Uh, you have three questions to choose from, and your last thought you want to express. Those are your choices, Jim. I think, I think um, uh, Arthur's right in that Loving Your Enemies book. How do we listen to people? Uh, part of when you're not neighbors with people, you're not listening to people. You're not just hanging around talking about, not politics, but your kids. Most people want the same things for their kids. <laughs> you're not talking about that stuff. 75% uh, of white people in America, 75%, have not one significant relationship with a person or family of color. We don't talk, so how do we in this, how do we turn, anger can be good, it's passion, it's, it's things have to change, but contempt for each other. Uh, I grew up in a church that was all the, those people that you talk about who voted for Donald Trump. Uh, how do we have a conversation, I would say, about Jesus? 
with those people in that, in their, their places. How do we do that? Uh, and I think um, uh, doing that is something that really could alter the narrative of our public conversation. If we're having personal conversations in our communities, and so someone says, well, I don't like the way you interpreted Jesus on this immigration question. I don't like your interpretation. I say, good, let's have a conversation. That's the point. How would you do it? There are differences about what immigration policy ought to be. Let's have that. But there's a tone, a spirit. There's a, there's a moral issue, as Justin said. How do we do that? So how can we have conversations at the local level in our families, like John's saying, at Thanksgiving, and not just at this media level. How do we have new conversations in a time when really the soul of the nation is really at stake right now? And the integrity of faith, our response to it, is also at stake. Adele, you've been watching this for a while. What should respond to the questions or tell us what we should be looking for over the next year? Um, I think it would be good to see when people cross faiths and work together. That's happened a lot with the Poor People's Campaign that I mentioned, that is actually a re-up of what Martin Luther King Jr. started to bring economic justice to a lot of people. And that has involved Christians and Jews and people from across racial ethnic groups and to the mall and to all these different places and bringing presidential candidates to them. Um, to speak to them. Um, and another example I can think of is right on the day of the inauguration, I did sort of off the mall coverage. And I remember going to a church where there was an African-American gospel choir sort of singing or rehearsing in the background. And I talked to a rabbi who was there and all of them were trying to sort of figure out what their next steps would be because they didn't want to be on the mall. And he said, a Jewish man, I am Muslim to me because he was already concerned about what was going to happen or how Muslims were going to be treated. So it really struck me that people were trying to identify with the other and, again, expanding this idea of who their neighbor is, even at that point. Would a brilliant young student ask you a question specifically? Yes, I appreciate that question, and I'll try to kind of briefly address it. I, um, the average age in my diocese is 26, and, uh, and, and families, um, live the reality of moving as being as, as of dealing with immigration also in the family as terms of, as its impact on on customs on language and so forth um, there are a lot of daca students in my diocese and it is a national scandal that we have not figured out how to solve this problem it needs to be addressed in a just way we have many young people who have a lot to contribute to the community and to the and to the and to the whole country and the, the lack of a political will is, is extremely disturbing. But a lot of young people, at least in my view of the church, we, that's part of our, our mission, is to pull together people where the different generations can talk to each other. Um, you, maybe you're not aware of this, but, but at least I grew up this way, and a lot of people who grew up this way. At home, we spoke Spanish because my grandparents spoke Spanish, and so all the talk about family, God, religion, uh, and when you're really angry, it was in Spanish. <laughs> you went to school, you learned English, my parents, you know, we, my grandparents continue to speak Spanish, but you go to school, you learn the English world. You, it's a, you live with two worlds in your head. And it's a great gift, but it's a struggle. And you try to kind of figure out how these two worlds relate to each other, because believe me, huh, un idioma es todo el mundo, no? A language is a world. And you kind of are working this. And, and I'm really proud of how people, the young people kind of pull together and really do become bridges to kind of, for their parents and their grandparents to understand what's going on here, and, and also for the rest of the country to kind of deal with, with kind of what their, what, what, what the, what the, what their particular Latino reality is. But I think, I think the, uh, the, the, we want in, in the church, and certainly in my, in my diocese, to encourage the voice and the articulateness of our, of our young adults to kind of take the leadership role in, uh, in expressing kind of what the needs are uh, of their families, uh, of their grandparents, who don't have the, the language skills to express it. I mean, it's, it's that basic. Um, who, who don't know how to call the sheriff if somebody is robbing them because they don't speak the language or because they're afraid that they're gonna ask for documents. This is, these are very real sorts of things. And so 
So it's just, it's a very high priority, but the world that goes on in the head of a young person is a very important world. It is a trial, but it's something that kind of is very enriching because it, it kind of shares a good thing. I'll just say one story about D Detroit. I went to say, celebrate mass at St. Hedwig's, which, uh, which at that point in downtown Detroit used to be a Polish parish, was now largely Guatemalan. And I went to say mass for their principal feast day, which is La Fiesta del Cristo Negro, and it's a big feast in, in, in Guatemala. And I remember I got there, they were very happy, they knew that my background is Mexican-American, and so they asked me, the first thing they said, thank you for being here, Monsignor, remember this, we're not Mexicans. And we forget this because they realize that the rest of the country thinks we are because we all speak that language. But there are individual specific communities, have their own stories, have their own generational realities, and that complexity needs to be respected. The little communities, parents want to transmit to their children what it means to be where we're from. And that's very important. Justin. Yeah, um, I guess first I'll address the cynicism conversation. I think, I mean, contempt the contempt question. I think contempt and cynicism are destructive. And ultimately, we have to be able to communicate that they're self-defeating, right? Um, and, and get people to understand that. Uh, and then I'll just, I'll end with a just kind of challenge for the audience. When I think of politics, race, and faith, there are two people primarily that come in my head. And that's Fannie Lou Hamer and Dorothy Day. I mean, these, these women were leaders. They were courageous and they were in the middle of the battle. We had some people that kind of stood over it and, and can speak into it, but they were in the middle of it. And, and what really uh, sticks out to me about those two ladies is that uh, they didn't fall for the false dichotomy that we have today, where we separate social justice and moral order, right? They were able to say, no, no, our faith is about compassion and conviction, about love and truth. Because one of the things we have to understand when you have justice movements, that have no moral order, that have no set values, they create new injustices. As we said earlier, when you have moral movements that aren't about justice, they become immoral. And so I think we need that balance of compassion and conviction, and those two ladies exemplified it. So I think when we have this conversation, to have a focus on people who've done it throughout history is extremely helpful because social justice and moral order are not uh, separate, they work together. To reference. Uh, let me close with uh, some previews of coming attractions and then ask you to help me uh, thank our panel here. Uh, I'm happy to announce in light of what Justin just said that the initiative is very proud to host the Washington premiere of the new PBS film on Dorothy Day, The Revolution of the Heart, the Dorothy Day story. That will be in late January. Uh, uh, don't miss it, it's gonna be powerful. Two other things coming up uh, for Catholics under 40, Salt and Light gathering. We have uh, a really timely uh, session, October 9th at the School of Continuing Studies downtown, Keeping Faith in Demoralizing Times. Uh, terrific uh, group of people to reflect on this. Two columnists from the Post, Michael Gerson and uh, Elizabeth Brunig, Gene Lewis from the National Committee on Nas uh, Responsive Philanthropy, and Monsi Alvarado of Beckett Law. Diverse in their background, their affiliations, their politics, but can help us understand how to keep faith, how to live with faith, hope, and charity in the midst of a demoralized Washington. And then on November 21st, uh, here at Georgetown, the Francis Factor at six years. We have done this each year. We're very honored that our new Archbishop, Wilton Gregory, is going to uh, be a part of that. Helen Alvarez, who is a, a terrific Catholic lay leader. And uh, Kim is going to moderate that panel, Kim Daniels. And I'm going to be a panelist because I have some things I want to say about <laughs> Pope Francis, uh, his impact, and the resistance to him. And that is on uh, November 21st. So. I want to thank Kim and Anna, who have done so much work to make this possible. Our new student fellow, Tessa, I'm going to pronounce your last name, Blackell. I've always just called her Tessa, and she does great work for us. And our two sponsors, the Berkeley Center here at Georgetown and the Institute for, of Politics and Public Service. But I especially want you to join me in thanking this terrific panel for their insight, their courage.
and we thank you for coming out in such numbers. This was a great evening. Thank you very much.